Well, dear friends, it's lovely to talk to you about the Psalms. The Psalms, of course, are the hymns of the Jewish people. They're the heart of their prayer life. They're very beautiful because they are so concrete. Jewish people, the, the Hebrew language itself, speaks about flesh and bones and breath and blood and just who we are. And of course, they are so symbolic though, these Psalms, because they talk about the great symbols of light and darkness, the symbols of being thirsty, thirsting for something, of being hungry for something. Symbols too of drowning or of finding, finally, st solid earth. Talks about longing, of being depressed, talks about the seas and the mountains, the great things, the great symbols, things that become symbols so easily for us. So they are quite extraordinary, quite profound. They touch into our hearts and to all the feelings we can have as human beings. They are originally uh, small collections of psalms. And, um, for example, a, a group of psalms from Psalms 3 to 40 were named Davidic Psalms of David. Another group, 41 to 48, were called Psalms of Korah, and so on. A bit later on, there were four more collections added, including the beautiful Psalms of Ascent, Psalms 115 to 133. And the glorious psalms, the praise psalms, the Hallel psalms. And then finally, around the year 100 BC, they were put together as one book, or rather as five different books within the one collection, and prefaced with Psalm 1 and ending with Psalm 150. And they're beautiful. As we look at our psalms, Three quarters of them have their natural situation within the liturgy. They are formed within either the uh, temple worship, most of them are temple worship, for the Sabbath or perhaps for the great feast days and so on. So most of these psalms are liturgical psalms. About a quarter of them are for personal use. So we get the real feel of these psalms only within liturgy. And we know, of course, that we Christians use the psalms too, and they are fundamental for us. Jesus himself knew the psalms off by heart, so many of them. On the cross, he was praying the psalm, 21, and so on. We as Christians then in the 2nd, 3rd and 4th centuries, continued to use the Psalms, realising that they were so beautiful and we would have been so grateful to have them from our Jewish brothers and sisters, even though we distanced ourselves from them. We felt they were ours too, and God spoke to us through them. We tended to Christianise the Psalms by three little things that we did. The first was... Every psalm had a heading, which means that it was a quotation either from the New Testament or from one of the fathers of the church. And then, at the end of our psalms, in many collections, we would place a prayer. We called it a psalm prayer, which summarized the, uh, the spirituality of the psalm in a prayer to God. And finally, we have antiphons antiphons for the psalms and at mass we know the psalm that uh, follows the first reading always has an antiphon and that antiphon can be taken from the psalm itself or from elsewhere and that just orients us towards the christian interpretation of the psalm so we'll we'll use the psalms always and in our own um, liturgy our christian liturgy within the Catholic Communion, the Psalms are used, nearly all of the Psalms, over a four-week period 
in the divine office. And um, that is especially for morning prayer and evening prayer. But also includes, includes the office of readings, the office of midday, the shorter office of midday prayer, and compline or night prayer. The Jewish people had a strong sense of praying in the mornings and the evenings. And so did the early church, fundamental to us. We praise God in the morning, we turn to God in the evening, as we're tired after the work of the day. Morning prayer and evening prayer are so fundamental in our thinking that I remember people coming to confession and saying, Father, I accuse myself of the following the sins. I've forgotten my morning and evening prayers. Now, you might think that's a bit funny, but really there's a profound truth there. Because of our baptism, we're called to praise God in the name of every creature under heaven at morning and at evening. So the Psalms, we will see, fit in rather beautifully there. I'd just like to now uh, look at the major types of Psalms. There are First off, half the psalms pretty well are psalms of praise and thanksgiving. Then the next big group, about 35% of them, are psalms of petition or lament. And the final group, a smaller group, perhaps 15% of the psalms, are the wisdom psalms and the historical psalms. So let's take a little bit of a look at the... Uh, Psalms of praise and thanksgiving. And the first big group within that are the hymns. Now, I'd like to look at what some people say is the pearl of the Psalter, the most glorious, most beautiful of psalms. It's a, uh, a beautiful psalm which the Jewish people sing on Yom Kippur. They sing on the feast of the new moon every month, and they sing in the winter Sabbath ceremonies. The Greeks, the Greek Orthodox Church, sings this psalm every day at Vespers. And we sing it um, in the Office of Readings once every four weeks. And we sing at the Feast of Pentecost at the Mass. I say we sing because we should sing. If we were French or Italians, we would sing. The psalms are meant to be sung. The word psalm itself means a psalm to be sung with a harp. Well, let's have a little bit of a look at Psalm 103. When I say 103, that's the Greek numbering. The Hebrew numbering is, is an extra one, 104. And uh, the reason why there's a difference between the Greeks and the Hebrew is because there's a slight difference in the Greek numbering of Psalms to the Hebrew numbering of Psalms. This is how it goes. Psalm 103 in the Greek, 104 in the Hebrew. Bless the Lord my soul. Lord God, how great you are, clothed in majesty and glory, wrapped in light as in a robe. You stretch out the heavens like a tent, Above the range you build your dwelling. You make the clouds your chariots. You walk on the wings of the wind. You founded the earth on its base. You made springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow in between the hills. They give drink to all the beasts of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. On their banks dwell the birds of heaven. From the branches they sing their songs. just reading a few lines from it. Do you have a sense that this is Genesis 1 revisited? Because it is. It's a profound meditation, not just meditative, an exaltation on, um, on the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Beautiful. There is the sea, vast and wide, with its moving swarms past counting, living things great and small, the ships are moving there too, and the monsters you made to 